Well, I'm going to start this morning telling, uh, revealing a little tidbit of completely useless information about myself. Um, I know that we are in the heart of beef country, and I am thankful for the, the pastor appreciation gift that you all gave me. But I want to reveal that I, uh, while I love a good steak, I also love fried chicken. And you already know my weakness for fast food. So fast food chicken joints rank pretty high on the, the joy meter for me. And while KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's okay. I'm more of a, I'm a Popeye's guy, Popeye's Fried Chicken guy. Uh, unless I'm down in Texas, Louisiana, and I can get churches, um, but w w I do with what I can up here. And one of the cool things, uh, living in La Vista, I, w I was fortunate that I had a Popeye's fried chicken just down the street from the house. And my family, they didn't like Popeye's. I, I, was, I was the only one. So I would go there frequently by myself. And I was, uh, my standard order was the two-piece big box meal, red beans and rice, mashed potatoes, Cajun gravy, and a biscuit. That was pff, finished. That was it. And I was there one day, and I had my order, and uh, I had put the butter on my biscuit, and I reached and grabbed one of the packets of honey. And, it, and I noticed it said, honey sauce. Honey sauce? Now, it looked like honey, and after mixing it with the butter on top of the biscuit, it was hard to tell that it wasn't butter, it wasn't honey. But make no mistake, it was not authentic honey. Apparently, in the extremely competitive world of fast food fried chicken, that was a, a cost-saving measure. They took authentic honey and replaced it with something that was fake. Popeyes, Popeyes doesn't care whether they are serving their customers authentic honey or not, the real deal or not. And let's be honest, they believe that once you're in the door, um, they've got you, and you're not there to eat healthy anyways. So um, honey sauce just isn't a, deter a determining factor on whether or not you go to Popeye's or not. And they know this. So what's the big deal? It's harmless, right? In this morning's message, we're going to see a, a similar situation and how, when it comes to God, uh, it's not harmless. And it is a big deal. And oh, by the way, if you ever go to Popeye's and you go through the drive through window, I don't recommend saying, did you put the honey in the bag? Because it sounds an awful lot like, did you put the money in the bag? And that tends to freak out teenagers <laughs> that are working the drive through window. Last week... We ended with Paul arriving in Ephesus on his third mission journey. And Ephesus is where Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. From Ephesus, he wrote to the church in Corinth. And we already know how bad Corinth was, right, with their immorality and everything. And uh, in one of those letters that he wrote, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And then later, he wrote to the church in Ephesus from Rome, and he said, For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. These words highlight the challenge that Ephesus was to the gospel. Ephesus was a, a stronghold of darkness that could be only overcome by the weapons that we have, the weapons of faith, the weapons of truth, the weapons of love, and the, le and the weapons of righteousness. Those are our weapons as Christians. And there are Many strongholds of darkness like this today. And we're going to see this morning that as a church begins to catch on to the power that God has given it, a light can be shown into that darkness. 
And this morning we're in Acts chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 20. Chapter 19, verses 8 through 20. And Paul begins, as always, in the synagogue, as, as Luke tells us in verses 8 through 10. He says, And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Paul began in the synagogue with the weapon of truth. He spoke in the synagogue concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Paul said, had come with the coming of Jesus Christ, and it was opposing the rule of Satan. Wherever the gospel went, it found people enslaved to the authority of the kingdom of Satan. The powers of darkness reigned in human affairs, much like it does today. That is why human history is plagued with accounts of humanity's struggles to be free from an authority, a kingdom that we can't free ourselves from. And it's this rule of darkness in our lives and that this authority of the kingdom of Satan, which the kingdom of God of Christ challenges. And at first, Paul's reasoning and teaching was welcomed. If you remember, they, he talked to the first time, and he said, hey, stay with us. Keep teaching us. And he left Priscilla and Aquila there. Well, now, the Jews are saying, uh-uh. He had returned as he promised for three months, every Sabbath day. He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures about the kingdom of God. But now... When the Jews understood what it, it meant to submit to the rule and authority, the lordship of Jesus Christ, they opposed him. When they realized that they could no longer present themselves in a respectable, moral way externally, because they were giving an outwardly fake morality, and they had... They had to acknowledge that inwardly they were just as in the dark, desperately in darkness and evil as anybody else in Ephesus. They couldn't come to grips with how they were presenting themselves with what they were experiencing inside. So they resisted Paul. And that's what religion does to a person and why Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Paul saw that the, the heat was coming and the Jews were, were stepping up their oppression and resistance to the gospel. And so he decided to withdraw and he took all of the believers, the disciples with him, and they moved to, from the synagogue to this temple of Tyrannus. And we don't know much about this hall, this temple of Tyrannus, but most speculate that it was a, a lecture hall where Greek teachers and philosophers used to teach philosophy and all of the other subjects of the arts and of the culture of the day. And some non-biblical literature uh, uh, appears to, to indicate that Paul rented this hall while he was in Ephesus. He rented it from 11 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he would continue to reason and teach. Now that time is interesting because at that time, in emphasis, it's, it's a time when everyone was taking a siesta, a nap. They closed up their shops, they would go home, have a large meal, leisurely, take a nap, maybe work out in the garden a little bit. And the working day began at 7 o'clock in the morning, so they'd close in the afternoon, and then they would reopen their businesses in the evening from till about 9.30 at night. That may sound interesting to some people. I'll tell you, uh, there are countries that still operate that today. Greece and Spain are two examples. I mean, in Greece, it was hard to get used to uh, not being able to do anything in the afternoon because everything was closed. Everybody's home taking a nap. And then they would come back and open up in the evening. And evidently, Paul did this hard labor of tent making during these 7 a.m. to 11 o'clock hours and then to support himself and maybe pay the rent for this hall. 
But at 11 o'clock, he would come to the hall of Tyrannus and he would lecture for five hours a day for two years to anybody who would listen to him. And Paul demonstrated his love for God and a, and a love for others in that way. Now, five hours a day for six days a week, 52 weeks a year for two years, that adds up to over 3,000 hours of lecturing. Now imagine the impact that his teaching had. No, it's no wonder we read in verse 10 of our passage this morning that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All the residents. And Asia is a province. At the time, it was bigger than the state of Nebraska and South Dakota combined. And all the people heard it. And it wasn't Paul who was doing all the teaching, though. It was the Christians who heard him in the lecture halls of Tyrannus and who carried these truths out to the whole area. They formed churches in other cities, and then those churches formed churches in, subsequently in other cities so that in two years the whole province was reached with the gospel of Christ it was during this time that the church of Colossae was planted these disciples of of Paul and Ephesus may have been the founders of the churches that the apostle John writes about the letters in the book of Revelation when he wrote to Smyrna and Sardis and Thyatira and Pergamum and Philadelphia and Laodicea all of those churches were in Asia, in this area. Folks, there is power in the Word of God. We may not be able to do it ourselves, but we cannot stop. It will not be hindered. Luke next confirms all this by telling us in verses 11 and 12 that, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the, and the evil spirits came out of them. Imagine being able to do that. Imagine being able to, to cast out demons. Those were amazing miracles. No need to go to a doctor. No need to take any medicine. No need to go to the hospital. Sicknesses of all kinds were simply healed. Coughs, cancer, arthritis, appendicitis, toothaches, tummy aches, leprosy, diabetes, dementia, it made no difference. The diseases departed. And that was that. But notice that it wasn't Paul's power. It was God's power. The verse 11 says God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Underline that word, extraordinary. Some Bible versions might say special. But the point is the, these miracles were unusual. They were different than other miracles that we've read about. They weren't miracles like we've seen in other parts of Scripture, even in the book of Acts. What made them different? They were performed by carrying away these, these cloths, these handkerchiefs away from Paul's presence. The miracles were accomplished away from him. He wasn't there. Now, there's, there's no value in these pieces of cloth, these aprons or the handkerchiefs. They weren't handkerchiefs in the usual sense. They, Paul didn't blow his nose on them and stick it in his pocket. These handkerchiefs were more like sweatbands, and the aprons were too. Because he toiled in... The, the hard labor of, of tent making, these bands tied around his head would keep the sweat out of his eyes and then the aprons would keep him clean and he'd be able to use it to wipe away the sweat. It was hard work. It was with these handkerchiefs and aprons, these items used in humble toil and labor, that these miracles took place. These are the symbols God chose to use in order to make a, a point about Paul. They're equivalent to Moses' staff. There was nothing special or magical about Moses' staff. It was a symbol of something about Moses that God honored and God used. And so these handkerchiefs and these aprons, they were symbols of the, the honest, dignified, hard labor of the apostle. His labor of love and humbleness. 
is servant character. And it's through those character traits that a conduit was created for the release of God's power. This is what God is teaching us here. It is through a person whose heart is so completely committed that he's ready to invest hard labor if necessary in order to make the gospel available to someone. Humble at heart, willing to do the hard work that the power of God is released. It's in his letter to the Colossians that Paul wrote, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. The same is true today, folks. We work for the Lord. Sometimes our labor gives us the ability to share the gospel at the same time. Sometimes we can do it at work. Our, our work allows that or creates that opportunity. But other times it doesn't. Sometimes you have to work hard and labor and toil to get resources or create opportunities that allow you to, to share the gospel outside of your work. But it's the same principle. Now in this labor, God used Paul to, to light a match in Ephesus. Let me tell you folks, when a match is lit or when a light is lit in darkness, it stands out. It is easily seen, easily noticed. And Satan is always watching for those flickers of light in the darkness so that he can quickly try to come in and snuff them out. If you're a Christian doing the Lord's work, you should expect Satan to notice and to move his forces against you. Satan saw this in the darkness of Ephesus and he, he tried to, to make an alliance, just like he did with Jesus in the desert after Jesus was baptized. He tried to team up with him. This is one of Satan's favorite tricks. And he tries to join the team here. He says in Acts 19, verses 13 through 17, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greek, and fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Now there's a, a lot of discussion in the commentaries about who these seven were and, uh, and what their abilities were. And I'm going to briefly just make three quick points. First, the, the Bible versions vary over the title of these seven. Some Bibles will say that they are the Jewish high priest, or that they were sons of the Jewish high priest. And some would say that the, or a chief priest. And the, the problem is that nowhere in the official records is the name Sceva listed as ever being a Jewish high priest. Either Sceva was simply a, a member of a high priestly family, or he assumed the title kind of in a, a professional purposes uh, in order to to impress people or impress the public. We can compare Sceva to modern day people who take on titles like doctor or professor but don't actually have those credentials. And the point of the story is, is not the status of the, of the exorcist but the, the attempt to use the name of Jesus. My second point is that there, are there really demons? Of course. Scripture tells us that there are. And if we believe this book that is complete, completely true and without error, that is inerrant, and it is, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and that there's a spiritual realm, we have no reason to believe that there wouldn't be evil spirits. Do they exist today? Of course. We still live in the same age as these New Testament writings, the church age, the new, the new covenant age. 
So just because we simply can't understand the spiritual realm and, and these entities around us with our, our five senses or the senses that we have, it doesn't mean that they don't exist or that the, the just a, uh, they're just as active today as they were then. It just means that there are parts of this world that we can't explain, that we can't understand. And then number three is, could these Jewish exorcists really cast out demons? Personally, I, I don't think so. And I say that because Scripture is clear that Jesus could, and Jesus extended that power to cast out demons to other believers. But demons cast out by Jewish non-believers? I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. I think the more likely is that these seven Jewish exorcists, they represented a, just a very large population of magicians and truth-sayers and fortune-tellers and palm-readers that were in Ephesus. That's what the city of Ephesus was, was filled with people like that. Those who practiced the dark arts, and there were many like that in Ephesus, trying to capitalize on the superstition of the community. Ancient musicians... Magicians like, like these Jewish exorcists were, they were syncretists. And what that means is they would hear things uh, about other religions that sounded uh, strange and that could be deemed effective and they would incorporate that into their spell books and they would use it to, be, to impress the, the superstitious people and make some money. But this message isn't about how to cast out demons. These Jewish exorcists in Ephesus were only applying their trade. Paul's spell in Jesus' name seemed effective for him. And so they said, well, let's give it a try. They copied the recipe like with some kind of magic formula. They created their own Jesus sauce. And they tried to cast out evil spirits by saying, I adjure you. And adjure is just means I, I demand, I command, I urge you, strongly urge you to remove yourself. And they would say, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. What does that sentence say about the people? I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They didn't believe any of that themselves. Luke is teaching us here that the name of Jesus has huge power, immense power, but only when it is a weapon wielded by those who genuinely call on Jesus as Lord. These pretenders didn't have the appropriate moral or spiritual integrity to stand up to the powers of evil. They were faking it. They weren't authentic. They were like hunters carrying guns but didn't have any bullets. We have, a, we have people like that around us today. People who know enough about the occult and the dark arts to, to sound impressive, but who are basically reckless and ignorant. They fool around with powers that they don't understand, and they, they don't care what will happen to the people who get involved with them, as long as they're able to make some money. We also have people who are believers, but their, their actions don't always line up with their words. They dismiss or, or minimize or, or even consider harmless. Cultural things that may be fun, but if, if not engaged with using biblical principles, simply won't bring glory to God. I'm going to say something this morning that might upset some people, I don't know. But w an example is we just went through a, a controversial example, that being Halloween and how Christians and, and churches engage that holiday. Sure, it can be participated in with biblical principles, but if we're not careful, our celebration will look an awful lot like worldly celebration. And perception has a way of impacting one's testimony, even a church's testimony. We're not called to be like the world. We're called to be apart from the world, called to be holy 
and then engage the world with biblical principles that we stand on. I think it's timely. I thought about changing this message and doing it last week before Halloween. But as I thought about it, I realized that the Holy Spirit, He works in His timing. And it's not irony, it's not a coincidence that I hit this passage out of all the months that we've been in Acts, the Sunday after Halloween. I don't think the Holy Spirit wanted me to engage people in a time right before Halloween and change things the way um, and get people thinking about that right before Halloween to be do so not to be divisive so my takeaway or my suggestion or my encouragement to you is this is now you got a whole year to kind of think about Halloween what what do I believe in why do, what is Halloween what is Halloween and why do I engage with it? How do I engage it in a big principle so that I can practice my faith and honor God? Because it's not an easy thing to honor God and celebrate Halloween if you truly understand what Halloween is. Okay, going back to my story at the beginning. Um, Popeye's fried chicken, they're, they're fortunate that they deal only with fried chicken and not evil demons. They only have to put up with customers like me saying, honey sauce, really? The evil spirit was angered by these guys who were, were trying to, to pass off this fake Jesus sauce. And it's, it's interesting what he said in response to these men urging him to leave this man. The evil spirit was angered. He says, now, Luke tells us that the, the evil spirit used two words for no. He said, Jesus, I know. And using that word, it's, uh, it has the meaning of that I know him very well. Uh, I have deep knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is. But then he uses a different word when he speaks of Paul. The word that he uses, uh, the Greek word he says, um, that Paul, I'm acquainted with. I, I know who he is. I know his name. I don't know him very well, though. Not like I know Jesus. And then he says, but who are you? How disrespectful is that, right? And suddenly the man who the Spirit was in, he, the Spirit led him or empowered him by the, by the evil spirit to, to challenge these seven men and he took them all on single-handedly. Can you imagine the scene? The, these hunters who were carrying guns with no bullets, they suddenly ran into a grizzly bear. Can you not see them tumbling out the doors and windows with their clothes torn and bloodied and wounded? It's kind of like the scene from Gunsmoke. You know, the old show Gunsmoke. You got Sheriff Matt Dillon, he, when he gets in a bar fight, what do they show? They show the front of the, the Long Branch Saloon, right? And the camera's on the Long Branch, and you hear all the tumbling and wrestling inside the bar, and all of a sudden guys are being thrown out the plate glass windows and out the, the swinging doors out into the street. That's what it was like. That's what people were seeing. These seven guys, this, this guy that has this demon is taking care of this whole group. And when the dust settled, what was the result? The result was that the name of Jesus was magnified. The people of Ephesus saw that the name Jesus had power, but only when combined with true belief and faith, real faith. And suddenly, the match that God lit in Paul, through Paul in Ephesus, had been put to some kindling. And the fire was growing. More light was being cast into the darkness. And the dark kingdom around Ephesus was, was crumbling under the pressure of truth and righteousness and love and faith. All of those weapons that we possess. The weapons of spiritual warfare. And, and look what happens next. In verses 18 and 19 it says, Also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Two things happened. First with the believers who came and divulging their hidden practices, confessing what they were doing in private. Obviously these were 
relatively new Christians, I assume, I suppose. Perhaps they had never thought that anything was wrong with their practices, that they, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were living worldly, but they had given themselves to Christ and said they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But as they sat under Paul's teaching, maybe they saw that the kingdom of God and how God longs to set people free, that they began to see what they had been doing was wrong. They, they were living a life that didn't match. Their inside wasn't matching the outside. The astrology, the horoscopes, and all the other superstitious practices, the seemingly harmless fun, had held them in bondage, as, and they weren't, weren't really glorifying God. So they began to confess all this, and they were freed from their bondage. They were seeing their unrighteousness and turning from it. And then the second thing that happened dealt with the pagans. The pagans, the, the sorcerers and all the, the people practicing the dark arts around the city, they took a second look at their own practices. Many of them who had practiced this, this dark art magic brought their books together and they burned them when they became Christians under the influence of the power of God's word. And this shows us how light breaks through the church. It's the church that is the light of the world. These exorcists surrendered all their spell books. That was costly. As they totaled up the value of these books, they burned 50,000 pieces of silver. In Ephesus, it's at, that would be the equivalent of about $6 million in today's funds. Apparently, the dark arts and playing with that kind of stuff is uh, apparently as, as financially profitable then as it is today. But the real impact of God's word here is that these people were changing the pattern of their lives. As they saw they could, they could no longer live lives as the, the rest of the community around them. And live as Christians too. You can't do it. It doesn't work. You can't live worldly even if it seems harmless. And at the same time live as Christians and try to glorify God. And this account makes very clear the path that evil takes to seize a hold of people. You see, hu human beings, we're, we're not easily invaded by evil forces or demonic forces. They can't force their way into human life. They can't overpower us and take possession of us. But that's what they want. They want to do that. So what they, what they do instead is deceive us. They find ways to trick us into yielding our wills to their influence and power. Let me ask you, if you needed a heart transplant, would you trust me to cut you open and give you a new heart? Is there anything, anything that I could say to you that would give you enough trust in me to cut you open and give you a new heart? Of course not, right? You would never trust me with that. There's only one certainty in life, and that's Jesus. Only He can give us a new heart when we trust Him. He takes our sinful heart and gives a heart that seeks to obey Him. And only when we trust Jesus can He deliver us eternally from all of this evil that we face. Only His plan of salvation guarantees us life. And only through the Word of God can we learn the truth about Jesus and the work that He did for us at the cross. Here in Ephesus, Paul and the other Christians, by the, the power of the truth, broke through all of that deception. Luke says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily, in verse 20. In fact, the very next passage that we'll see take up, that we'll take up next Sunday, tells us that a riot breaks out after the way the Christians crash those strongholds of evil. They shed a lot of light into that darkness and the, sin and the darkness fought back. But that's how a church ought to operate. In the power of the Spirit and by the authority of the Word, there are strongholds of darkness in this world all around us today. And it doesn't have to be the easily recognized dark arts or the, what they call the, the Eastern philosophies. Satan's too smart for that. 
He's too cunning to use just those means. He uses common things in our culture that are less obvious. Drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, gambling, pornography, violence in movies and video games. It's getting more graphic and more real, more vulgar, more lifelike. His goal is to numb us. Numb us to his influences, to, to get us to trust in those things instead of Jesus. And all of those things are only temporary. All of these things and many others either have been or are being normalized in our culture. At a minimum, their real impact on an individual is being dismissed. We have professional psychologists and psychiatrists out there saying, oh, video games, no, they're not harmful at all. Wrong. They are. We can see it. We can see it with our own eyes. This is happening all across the country, and these things lock people into a bondage they will never be freed from apart from Christ. The only way to break free from it is through Christ. Our culture, our nation... Our community, they need, it needs the light to shine brighter in the darkness. God wants to deliver people from this, from these strongholds. And he's given the church the power to do it. God grant that we may wake up to what we can do in this day. To how the whole of life around us can, can be easily, it can be distracting but it can be drastically altered by the church and by the sharing of love and by faith in a living God who opens doors and gives access to anyone who seeks him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, we ask you to make our faith grow strong enough to understand that this is what you long to do in this very area, in our community. We see similar powers of darkness enslaving people in our community, locking them in misery and heartache and fear, emptiness. And they're turning to all those places that Satan wants them to turn to instead of to you. Lord, help us to understand that this is a very tragic time to live and that we must not waste our time on empty activity. Help us to give ourselves to the, the battle against those powers of darkness. Help us be a light to the community as individuals and as a church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.